On the podcast with us today is John Jacobus. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Dan. Thrilled to be here. Well, good. Well, I'm looking forward to this, John. I know we talked a little bit on the green room about this Gray's Creek Mobile Home Park, which is 70 spaces located in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We're going to dive deep into this particular um, asset. And so before we get started, though, I want you to give the listeners a little bit of a background about you and, uh, and your experience in this uh, multifamily and mobile home space. Sure. Yeah. So I got started in the early 2000s as a college student, uh, fixing and flipping single family homes in Southern California. So I rode that equity wave in the early 2000s and uh, parlayed the gains from those investments into some long-term single-family home rentals that I, that I still own out in Arizona. Um, and about that time, then I just sort of pivoted and got really interested in public equity market investing. Um, I was introduced to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and sort of did a deep dive into you know, the, the playbook of value investing and uh, the style of Buffett and Munger. Um, and so that sort of took me sidetracked for a bit. But then about 2015, I got back into real estate and got interested in multifamily. Uh, that coincided with my move to New York City and uh, saw a bunch of multifamily units around me and said, hey, this is, there's something to this, there's cash flow, uh, and just sort of followed my nose, uh, made some investments in the Dallas-Fort Worth area as a limited partner in this large syndications, and then just sort of slowly took continuous steps towards becoming more active, took a GP role in some apartment communities in San Antonio. Um, and throughout the Southeast, and then and got interested in mobile home parks about a year ago. And I've really uh, spent a lot of time and energy uh, pursuing deals and uh, finally closing on two in this past December. So, um, and now it's, you know, we really like multifamily in the, in the Southeast and mobile home parks throughout the same region, uh, primarily because of the cash flow and a lot of creative things that you can do and adding value and just running small business. Well, I'm looking forward to diving into this one called Grace Creek. And I know that uh, you have some unique things that have happened on this asset. So it'll be a learning experience for a lot of people. And uh, I know a lot of times when we have these types of assets, they are, they're nice to kind of revisit as well to kind of learn how much you actually went through. And you, go, you look back and I guarantee you'll probably listen to this episode, John, and go, man, we did a lot of work to kind of get that particular yeah. project. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, only a month behind and we're already sort of there, right? It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's incredible. It was a long pursuit and a lot of twists and turns along the way. So yeah, yeah. It's looking forward Is this to one that. closed, you said in December, 2018, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. And it was the first one that came up. I mean, as I said, we spent most of 2018 really going through a variety of different channels, trying to build the deal flow, looked at a lot of deals, went to visit some, put some on a contract, you know, went out of contract. So we started pursuing this one in July and uh, spent a couple of months. So it, then it finally closed in, in December. Well, let's start by how you originally found this deal. So how did you actually find and source this one originally? Sure. So we sourced this through a network of friends and fellow investors. So, uh, you know, for mobile home parks, in contrast to the large multifamily, um, there's fewer of them. There's only about 45,000 of them in the country. And as a result, uh, to really get some healthy deal flow, you need to cast a wide net. So for us, you know, we work with brokers, we send out some direct mail, uh, and we network with other owner, operator, investors, just in an effort to cultivate as many active channels as possible so that we can see as many deals and place ourselves in the, the flow of deals. Uh, for this, we actually have a small community of mobile home park investors in New York. Uh, we meet pretty regularly, about monthly, and in the course of just discussing and talking about areas of interest in terms of uh, markets and what was coming up, this particular deal came up. Friends of ours had uh, uh, cultivated this lead through direct mail marketing and gotten it under contract. And they had a couple in the pipeline that they were working, but at the same time, they were really uh, looking and ramping up to establishing a fund. And for them, the priority was really getting the fund off the ground. And as a result, they needed to assign these other deals that they liked, just didn't have the time or the energy to pursue them. So they, they shared it with us, said, hey, would you guys be interested? We said, yep, we'll take a look. Uh, upon digging and looking at the pretty thorough diligence package, we said, yep, we would like to take on this contract. And, and then the contract was assigned to us. So when you're talking about uh, them giving it and assigning it to you, did they already have it under contract when they, they signed did. it to you? Yep, they did. Okay. Yeah, they had, they had had it under contract for probably about 45 days, um, and they were nearing the ex expiration date for, or the, the deadline for their earnest money deposit to go hard. Um, 
And so they had done a, a ton of work on the diligence, right? They, they had really spent a couple of weeks, really turned under all the rocks. And uh, so we, we had a fairly thorough due diligence package to review by the time that contract was uh, brought to our attention. Did you have to find, pay them some sort of wholesale fee or finder's fee or anything like that? We did. Yeah, we were happy to pay them fees. I mean, we're, we, we love paying referral fees or um, if people can bring us good deals, I think that's money well spent. So uh, yeah, yeah we, we paid them a small referral fee and, and we're happy to do that. So when you, when you had this one assigned, at what point before it being officially assigned to you, did you go and actually tour the property? So we didn't tour it until after it was assigned to us, uh, probably two or three weeks after we got the contract assignment. Uh, we showed up boots on the ground there in Fayetteville. So is that, is that typical or do you guys normally see, see it beforehand? You know, it depends. I think we would like to, if not us, then have a, you know, person on the team or someone we know and trust to go and check it out. But, you know, for us, we, we thought it was a good deal. We didn't have the ability to get down there in short order, given that most of us are in New York and this is a couple hundred miles away. And so we did as much as we could on Google street view and, talking to people to just sort of do the sniff test. We had the benefit of a very thorough due diligence package and the friends who were assigning us the contract, they had been down there and gave us the play by play. They had some iPhone videos that they were able to share. So we felt as if we had a pretty good sense of whether this was worth uh, moving forward with. And at the end of the day, if we, you know, after seeing on site what the property looked like post putting it under contract, we always had the opportunity to back out. So um, we were comfortable with getting it in a contract without having uh, boots on the ground. So there's a couple of questions that are, are, I'm just kind of coming up with in my head here as, I, as we're going through this. I, I'm not as experienced in the mobile home space, so there might be some dumb questions that I might ask, but I'm sure other people might be thinking them at the same time. Sure. So on, on, obviously on some of the mobile home parks, you are actually buying the actual mobile homes in addition to the spaces. And this one, you only bought the spaces. So in a, in a typical multifamily space, when you go and tour the property, if you will, you're going unit by unit by unit, but here you're not buying the units, you're just buying the spaces. So what do you actually do when you're on site and when you do that quote unquote tour? Yeah, sure. So a couple of things. So one is the market, right? Just getting a sense of the market. We're able to do a lot of diligence on the market, the health of the market off site. Uh, but it's always good to go and drive the property uh, to see it at various points in the day and also points in time during the week. So for us, we were there on a Thursday afternoon uh, we were there on a Friday and a Saturday, and we also showed up on Saturday night because, I mean, there's some, you know, lore, mobile home park lore around what goes off on Saturday nights. And we wanted to see if that was, you know, party time or it was just crickets. So we, uh, interesting story on that front is as we were driving through, you know, we looked awfully suspicious because we had our lights on. There were a couple of guys in a truck and we were just creeping around the property and, you know, we were probably 15 minutes in just looking around and going slowly when we found, uh, we just sort of realized that there was someone following us throughout the park. And it got to a point where they started flashing their brights and, you know, we thought, oh, okay, we're just going slow and we need to get over here. Well, we turned, you know, we, we veered off to the side of the road and waved uh, the car forward and they wouldn't go. They just kept, you know, close distance behind us, kept flashing the brights and then started to rev the engine. And then we started putting things together and, you know, realized this person's running us out of the park. I mean, this is the local sheriff, right? That was uh, keeping an eye on what's going on in the park. And at the time, you know, we were kind of freaked out because it was about midnight and, you know, we didn't know where we were. We didn't want to upset anyone. Uh, but looking back on it, we thought, hey, that's actually, that's actually kind of nice. You know, I'd like to live in a community where there's sort of the unofficial uh, police force that's keeping an eye on strangers and running them out if there's some suspicious activity going on. So, uh, you know, getting a sense for that kind of stuff, the dynamic of what's going on in the park is one of the things that we look for uh, by just spending time there and seeing what it's like at various points in time during the week and during the day. Uh, the other thing besides market diligence is infrastructure. So checking out, you know, for this, for Grays Creek, it's on a private well and uh, has a septic system. So coordinating meetings with plumbers and well operators so that you can just get a sense for the operational history of those infrastructure items and see you know, what state of uh, 
repair they're in or and what the history has been with those key infrastructure items. Uh, while we don't own most of the mobile homes in this particular park or parks in general, we do still care about the condition of the homes because that sets the stage for uh, the quality of life, right? It's the visuals or people keeping up their homes. Is there a bunch of trash in the yard? Are they uh, well-maintained in terms of, you know, washed every year? Is it just, what's the general feel and look of the property? Is there a sense of pride of ownership? That for us matters because in, in this particular case, there's 20 vacant lots that we're looking to fill in. And so as prospective residents in this community, is this a place where I would feel comfortable and want to call home? And the nature of the other surrounding homes really would dictate how I feel about that. Just like you would feel moving into a single family home in a neighborhood, right? You're gonna check out the, how the other neighbors are keeping their homes. It's the same thing. Um, the roads are a big thing as well, right? Other major infrastructure item in addition to the well and the septic or water and sewer are the roads. So seeing where there's uh, areas of disrepair or needed for patchwork. Um, and that's, those are really the key things that we look for when we're looking at diligence. So from, in terms of the physical infrastructure and, and what we're looking at and assessing. And so when you go and do that on these properties now, since you've done so many of them, or do you now have like a, a checklist that you bring or you just kind of have it off the top of your head that you kind of know now? You know, it's pretty well ingrained in memory by now because we've been through it a bunch of times, but we try to be thorough. I mean, we're, we're believers in checklists and, you know, humans are, have many flaws and, you know, in the heat of the moment chasing a deal, we try to remain uh, as rational and unemotional as possible. So having a checklist that either we have live with us in digital format or mm. shortly thereafter, we just go through and are methodical about it. Uh, we, still, we still follow our diligence checklists. So when you got this a contract assigned to you, you had mentioned them that the original um, uh, people who had the contract, the original buyers, one of your friends, that they had had some, some earnest money that was about to go hard if they you know, didn't make a decision on something there. How much of that hard money did you have to now put up not hard money, but earnest money did you have to put up to be able to have that contract assigned? We completely cashed them out uh, on their earnest money. So in addition to, so we, at the, at the time that we signed the contract, or the, the contract was assigned to us, the only cash out of hand for us was the cash out of the earnest money. We agreed to pay them assignment fee upon successful closing, but cash out of hand was that uh, earnest money. Now, it didn't immediately go hard. As part of the contract assignment, we negotiated to uh, have an extension on that earnest money deadline because we were new to the deal and we wanted at least two weeks to be able to do the sniff test and really check it out for ourselves. So, you know, the story continues because, you know, as, we'll, as we go and dig in here, milestones continue to be pushed, but at least in terms of the initial signing that we did have a period of time where we didn't immediately go hard with our earnest money and it was still very low cost for us. We were just cost of getting down there and uh, you know, the soft costs of uh, checking out the property. So I know the, the, the purchase price on this one was 700,000 and we're going to get into some of the unique things that you did from a, from a finance perspective on this one. Um, but on, as far as the, the earnest money, how much did you guys actually have to put up for, for that? So it was about a one and a half percent for okay. money. Pretty yeah. standard. Yeah. So about 10, 10 grand. Yeah. And so you had about, once you had received the assignment, then you got 14 days or whatever to be able to, you know, make, you know, do your due diligence piece before it went hard, if you will. And then uh, I'm sure we'll talk some more about, you know, how you were able to, <laughs> to change some of those extensions and, and stuff like that. So uh, first thing I, I, the next thing I, 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 I want to ask you about is, the, the due diligence process on this one, because I think that's really where the extensions kind of came into play. So walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, so there's a couple of areas, of, you know, three core areas of diligence, right? We talked about the market due diligence. Is this a healthy market where we're going to see demand for affordable housing and a need for the product that we have? You know, with the 20 vacant lots, a major component of the upside in this opportunity was our ability to quickly fill these vacant units with actively paying residents. Um, so we ran test ads, right? We, we just sort of assessed the community to see if there was uh, demand for this type of product in the area. 
so that, that was the extent of the, the market due diligence. We also had financial due diligence where we were looking at the property records. So they were uh, pretty well kept books and they had records going back about four years of pretty clean profit and loss, tax statements and rent rolls. So we were able to dig through those. We even uh, traced those back to the bank records and most of that all tied out pretty cleanly. Really rare in the mobile home park space, really in that zone too, because uh, this is a world in contrast, one of our other properties, we had a handwritten scratch pad full of rent collection records over you know, the past five years. And that was the extent of the financials that we had to, to look at. So uh, we got lucky in the sense that the financials were very solid and uh, really made that piece quick. Where we ran into challenges and where really the, the story unfolds is on the physical due diligence. So looking at the infrastructure of the park and really the core part of the asset that we own. Uh, upon digging into that, we found very quickly that the water well had several outstanding violations over a period of a couple of quarters and remained you know, in uh, a state that was not supported by the Department of Environmental Quality. And uh, so that was a red flag for us that then led to additional negotiation and discussion around what we were going to do. So one thing you mentioned is, is running test ads when you were doing your, your marketability of it. Can you, can you tell us what you do there? Sure. Yeah. So for us, we use Craigslist to just put up a generic ad. So for us, we had uh, mobile home spaces to rent. So we put up a, just a very simple ad saying, mobile home spaces to rent in Southeast Fayetteville, you know, for 300 bucks a month, uh, pet friendly, give us a call. And so it's very generic, but targeted into the region. And so we're trying to accomplish a couple of things here. One is, um, you know, assess whether or not there's interest in our area of the metro. And then two, at the market rate that we anticipate renting our units out to. So market rate was you know, much higher, we thought much higher than the current rental rate on the property. And so to actually prove that, we wanted to gauge interest in the market at that, you know, the pro forma rent. So we ran a test ad on Craigslist and you, know, you wait. So we set up, uh, we use some software that allows us to generate a fake number that's local. So we use Grasshopper. I put the Grasshopper number on the test ad and just waited for phone calls to come in. So for us, we try to gauge it, you know, we run ads about over a 10 day period and we're looking for something that has at least 30 responses. So these are just inquiries. We don't answer them, or in this case, we didn't answer them. We're just trying to gain a sense of, you know, is there interest at this market level of rent that would allow us to generate enough leads and lead us to believe that we could infill at that rate that we're looking to achieve. And so what does it cost you to run those, those uh, ads on uh, Craigslist? On Craigslist, it's free. Okay. Uh, now, in other markets, and we're going through this right now, it's completely dead on Craigslist. Right? Craigslist is a weird thing. Some markets, it's the only place that you go to advertise. And in other markets, that's not the case. So we're experiencing that right now in the Midwest where it's a complete graveyard on Craigslist. So we pivoted and put an ad in the local paper and did some Facebook marketplace ads and it's blowing up. So uh, we go in, going in position is Craigslist. And if we, don't see, if, if we don't see much activity, then we'll try one or two options and, and then see what it gets us. Hmm. So you, it's either no cost or very low cost. Uh, and that's the goal, right? We want a quick way to gauge the market without spending a bunch of money and to just qualify, hey, is this worth pursuing, right? Because diligence is about keep just Keep peeling back the onion, poking your nose into the various corners. And if you find something, okay, how assess the impact and sort of keep the log so that when you're done, you, you either have got a big list of heavy hitters that you go back to the seller with, or you don't find anything and you get even more excited about doing the deal. <laughs> um, what about the calls? Do they just go to a generic voicemail or do, you, do they just like hang up on the people or how does that work? Yep. It just goes to a voicemail inbox. And one of the things that we like about the product, the Grasshopper product is it actually does voice uh, transcriptions to email. So we can uh, see the flow of calls and then actually read on, on our email inbox messages that are left. So yeah. people say, Hey, can you call me back? I'm interested. I've got a home and I want to move it in ASAP. Um, so that's, it's, it's a really simple, fast and easy way to gauge the market. 
especially since we're remote, right? We're all, we're all hundreds of miles away, but um, we can make this happen and it's fairly simple and, and fast. Well, I'm just thinking about this whole process that you do. I've never actually heard that before, but it makes sense about, you know, t- t- running some test ads, but I can even see maybe even doing something like this and, and this like the, the regular multifamily, you know, where they're actually at apartment complexes. You think you can get these, uh, the, your, your rents up to a certain amount. Well, post an ad, you know, on something, you know, to right. see, you know, can, can you, are there, is there inquiries about that, yep. you know, yep. are people willing to spend that money? Exactly. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's the same. It's, it's run of the mill to go and mystery shop and call others, but like, why not, why not let the world tell you if there's interest, right? Put it now, out where did there. you come up with that idea, John? So this, this is not an original idea. Um, I've got to credit, you know, Frank Rolf of the Mobile Home University on uh, this whole concept. And uh, he's been one of our mentors in uh, getting to know this, this unique niche and this part of their, you know, standard course of items that they do during due diligence. So we just, we're, we just embrace this, embrace it and uh, follow in the process and doing what works. So, oh, good. Well, I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, it sounds, sounds like it makes sense and uh, obviously it's working and certain, have, having certain criteria like that. So, you know, going into now some of the physical due diligence that you, that you guys have gone through on this one and, you know, that the water well violations, you know, obviously when you, when they were, when you, well, let me ask you this, at what point during that physical due diligence you know, did you actually find that out? And who was it that found that out? And, and what, what actually transpired after that? Yeah, it was fairly early on. We were probably a week or two in. And, uh, you know, we tried, we go to the county sites, right, to see if there are any outstanding violations on the park in general, which include, in this case, you know, the water well. So we are a private provider because we're serving a community with, you know, source of water. And so as part of the reporting process, we need to file a report to the, in this case, the State Department of Environmental Quality. And, you know, if you're within an acceptable limit on a variety of different minerals or hard metals or what have you, then, you know, you have a clean bill of health. And then if not, then you either need to remediate it or just continuously monitor it or shut down the well altogether and drill a new one. So for us, we were, uh, as part of our checklist items, it's to go to the county uh, check that the park is still in good standing. That may be, you know, usage of the property. It may be, you know, various violations for whatever reasons, um, including, you know, utilities. And so we found the, the violations and you can see the history all the way till the beginning of the park. What, how many violations for what caused the timing, whether or not it's been remediated. And so we found, you know, several months worth of violations as it related to radon levels in the, in the water. And what, what did you do as far as going back to the seller? Cause obviously that's a, a red flag that you might go, wait a minute. I don't know if we want to move forward with this. Right. Yeah. So we just raised it. You know, we said, Hey, were you aware of this? Uh, we found this during our diligence. What's the current status because it's been outstanding for a while. And what's your plan for remediating it? Um, and that just sort of opened a conversation to, <laughs> To nowhere immediately, <laughs> um, and it was a you know a showstopper and a point of contention for quite a while. Did the did the owner admit to knowing about it beforehand? They eventually did. It, you know, it's hard to it's hard to recall on this one who said what and if they actually owned up. But eventually, I mean, the park manager knew about it and was open and discussing it with us. And I think there was also a second layer of management there. They were aware and and were open and sharing it with us. But for us, you know. It was kind of a surprise, didn't know about this. And, and that's fine. You're going to find things, right? We, we, we didn't feel as though a fast one was being pulled on it, on us, but we were interested in, okay, what's the next step? Are you guys actively pursuing this? You know, where do we stand here? Is, is there a timeline that you need to complete this by? You know, have you really upset the county and they're really knocking on your door? Or is this just sort of a mild violation that you just can get around to fixing when you get around to it? Mm-hmm. Um, the frustrating part with us was we weren't really able to get anywhere with any of our questions because the nature of the seller was um, the seller has a very large business that they run that consumes really most of their life and priorities one through seven for them are running and building this business. And the seller also owned a large portfolio of single multi family and mobile home park assets. And so this was very much a side business that, wasn't really important to this person. They had at one point in time owned several mobile home parks. 
they decided the business really wasn't for them and was slowly exiting. And this mm. was the last of their assets they were looking to dispose of. Uh, so for us, we just really weren't top of stack for uh, the seller. And as a result, couldn't get timely answers to the questions that we really needed to get to the bottom of. So what, what, what ended up being the result of all of that? Because obviously, well, let me just ask this. What you, what did you, did you did you mention? I know I know, but because I know we talked about it in, in other you know settings. But what was the actual violations with the water well? Yeah, so the violation was the radium levels in the water were just one, I forget the unit of measure for this for radium, but uh, five uh, five. Let's just call it milligrams per deciliter. It's wildly off on units of measure, but we're picking that one. <laughs> uh, so if five is the acceptable limit the measure that had come back pretty consistently for the past couple of months was six and seven. So it was just a smidge over the acceptable limit. Um, so, but when we first saw that, you know, we didn't know any better. I'm not a chemist and I'm not a water quality expert and none, neither are any of my partners. Uh, so we didn't know if this was really an egregious violation and we didn't know how common it was. And so we were just sort of had no clue how bad this really was. Uh, so that led us down a number of paths. We talked to some actual water well experts that drilled wells and specialized in uh, operating wells. Uh, we spoke with some environmental attorneys to see, you know, what the case history was here and, you know, what were our, what was our exposure? If we were to take over this park with an outstanding violation, would that expose us to any claims that occurred before we owned the park? You know, we really just had no idea what we were stepping into. Uh, you know, recall the, the movie Erin Brockovic, where, you know, she was dealing with kind of the same thing with PG&E and poisoning the residents. And, you know, we did not want to step into that zone at all. Uh, so in an effort to really get our arms around the nature of the issue, how severe it was, what our exposure was in terms of liability, if we were to take on the park with the violation outstanding, that's, that uh, took a lot of time and uh, was a new path that none of us had explored before. So, you know, this could have been very simple had the owner just taken action and resolved the issue, whether that's to filter out the problem by installing a new filter, drilling a new well, or just taking action in a timely manner. But because they were so non-responsive, that's, and, and because we remained very interested in moving forward with the deal, that led us down a variety of different paths to say, hey, do we want to walk away with this? The likelihood of the owner really responding or giving some clarity here on a, a resolution path is low. So if that's the case and we're going to have to take over this park with this outstanding issue, what does that mean? You know, is that, is that a bad thing? You know, we, it's a hot environment, right? It's, it's competitive. The, it's hard to find value in this market. And so for us, we have to get comfortable if we, we are interested in value and we want to find things that we can uh, get a discount on, but also find opportunities to increase the value of the property, uh, we got to get comfortable with some warts on deals, right? That's uh, the mobile home park space. There's sort of hair and warts on every deal. And it's how, you know, how many warts and how much hair is really the variable factor. So for us, you know, we, we weren't, we were okay with squeaky clean. We, we, were, we were okay with something that wasn't squeaky clean we just didn't know if this was really a red flag that we should run away from or to dig into. So um, that led to, you know, months of exploration and talking to other experts and trying to get some clarity with the seller, um, but not really getting anywhere. And what did you end up doing with the, 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 the water, the water well issue? Yeah. So what we, we end, so this over the course of four months, right. Continue to ask questions, try to get a plan. You know, ultimately they came back and said, you know what, we just don't have the time expertise or the energy or the interest to fix this thing. You guys fix it. We'll give you a smart, you know, we'll give you a, a, a slight discount on the price, but we just want this deal to go away. You take on this problem and uh, there was a fair amount of back and forth on what was the appropriate discount on the price. Uh, but eventually they said, we're not going to do anything about it. It's your problem to solve. Um, and that's where we landed. So, okay, now we need to get comfortable with taking over a property with an outstanding issue in speaking with the environmental attorneys, got a sense for, okay, just how bad would it be to live in this park and consume this water that is, uh, that is poisonous? 
Well, in doing that, we learned, you know, the probability of you contracting cancer as a result of consuming radon at this limit, you know, you'd have to be doing it for sort of 75 years. If someone had over the course of 75 years consumed this on a daily basis, there's something like, you know, less than 1% chance that they would contract cancer. So not only is the probability low, but then also if you take this to court and someone uh, tries to claim that you poisoned them and gave them cancer as a result of serving them this poisonous water, um, you know, correlation doesn't mean causation. So the, there are a variety of different factors that could influence your health outcome over the course of 75 years, right? You may smoke, you may drink frequently, you may uh, adopt other unhealthy practices. Um, so in the course of just sort of exploring those avenues and assessing just how bad could this get, uh, we got comfortable with it. So with the appropriate discount, and we were also able to get a warranty on the, uh, the water well. So eight, for eight months past closing, uh, if should anything go wrong with the well that would you know, further plummet us into a, a deteriorating state with the well, that would be the seller's uh, problem to deal with. So between the significant discount, uh, between the seller financing and this warranty period, those were ultimately the factors that got us to a comfort level with, with moving forward with this outstanding issue. So now, you know, one, one month into the project, uh, we are actively working with contract plumbing contractors to explore a new well site and to actually drill a new well. Okay. And so what was the original purchase price? I believe it was 730000 uh, we got them down to 700000 uh, And originally, it was also bank financing. And the banks that were willing to lend on this uh, were at about 70% loan to value. Um, so, you know, it's pretty difficult. I mean, bank financing is hard, hard to go through, right? It's a difficult process. They yeah. still weren't super comfortable about the outstanding water well. Uh, so we were able to go from 730 and bank financing and 70% LTV to... 700 with an eight month warranty on the well and seller financing five, five years interest only uh, at 80% LTV. So, but you know, that was a, over the course of six months, right? From July all the way until December um, through a course of really frustrating encounters and discussions with them where we either not getting a response, uh, getting nowhere and just ultimately forcing his feet to the fire to, to get us the terms that we needed. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the seller financing here a little bit too. So we've kind of been diving into the, the physical due diligence and stuff. What, what, uh, walk us through the seller financing that you did on this thing. I know you kind of briefly mentioned it there, but kind of walk us through that a little bit more. Sure. Yeah. So, so our, our, um, you know, we wanted to keep debt service low because there was a period of time of uncertainty where one, we, we had vacant lots that we needed to fill. So we wanted a cushion to be able to boost the value of the property and the income we needed sort of a, a safety period where we could do that. So that was important to us. We really had uh, limited capital that we, we had to deploy here. So we did not syndicate this deal. 700 for us uh, to go through a full syndication, you know, would damage the economics of the deal. So it really didn't make sense that way. And this was our first mobile home park and we wanted to prove out the model and build our credibility before we brought outside capital. Uh, so this, the, that's what led us to just do a joint venture on this. Uh, but we didn't have a lot of capital to deploy to the deal. So we're trying to go in light with the capital and have a high LTV while still, you know, having a margin of safety and adequate debt service coverage. Um, so where we got them to was 80% uh, loan to value. Uh, interesting on the actual down payment due at closing, we were able to phase it in. So we had about half due at closing on the 20% gap uh, that we needed to bring to the table. And then after the first month, uh, of owning the park, after which we were able to collect the first month of rent, which is a substantial amount of income, then we could pay the remaining half of the down payment after the first month of, of ownership. So that was a creative thing that we were able to do and really helped us out to close the deal. And then uh, we had five year balloon payment, right? So term five years, uh, interest only uh, for a fixed interest rate over the life of the loan. That's a phenomenal deal from a seller financing standpoint. For sure. Yeah, yeah, we were, we were thrilled with what we were able to get there. So when you go back to the, the original deal or the original, you know, pop, uh, like, like traditional, you know, lending on this one or a lender that you're trying to work out with this, were they, were they still kind of having issues as well with the, with the well? Like, were they still wanting to lend on without that being rectified? 
Not really. No, yeah. we never got a firm commitment. And that would, I mean, that was leverage for us, right? We were able to go to the seller and say, look, we can't finance this deal with the bank. We're not getting a firm commitment. They're uneasy about the issue with the well. We either need you to fix it, in which case we can get some traditional financing, or you need to entertain, you know, a seller carry if you don't want to fix the well. Mm -hmm. So um, what was frustrating for us, and we were really looking for commitments from banks, uh, it actually ended up being to our benefit because we could use that as a lever to push the seller in a direction that worked better for us. At what point during this entire process did you guys decide that you might want to assign it to somebody else as well? You know, it was probably three months in um, where, so we had known about the water issue, had tried to, you know, work with the seller, complete, uh, you know, non-starter, non-responsive, you know, take two weeks to just get a simple response, yes or no, to fairly basic questions. Um, and at that point, we had to make a call as a partnership group of wh whether we were comfortable moving forward as the property stood or not, which meant, you know, do we want to take over this property with a faulty well or no? Uh, and about half of the partners at the time said, you know, we're just not comfortable. Um, we're only okay if we can get an indemnity purity period or if we can get this well uh, fixed before we take it over. So at that point, you know, we just half of our capital walked away and we said, well, we can't really take this deal down anymore. So we then said, okay, the best thing to do is to pursue uh, another assignment. So at that point, this was probably October by this point, um, we went and just heavily shopped the deal. So we talked to probably 50 people over the course of three or four weeks and really tested, I thought, the market for, uh, for this size and, and type of product. And uh, consistently we got no, not comfortable, not enough of a margin of safety on the price given the, the risk with the well, um, you know, a little bit small and all variations of no, not comfortable, good luck. Uh, so while as frustrating and as time consuming as that whole process was, which was roughly the, the month of October, um, it again added to our stack of levers or, you know, our, our arsenal of levers that we could use in going back to the seller because uh, we're, we're fairly well connected with the mobile home park investor community. It's a small community to start with through bigger pockets, through various Facebook groups, through our own internal network and relationships with some pretty big operators. We cast a very wide net and really tested the appetite of the market. So with no's coming back, you know, 40, 50 different times, we were able to go back to the seller and say, look, good luck to you. You know, we, we think we've tested the market thoroughly and talked to a number of different people. There's no interest here at its current price and with the current deal terms. We still like this deal and have put in the time and energy. We're the likeliest closer here. So work with us and come to terms so that you can get this park off your hands. You can go tend to your business and grow your, you know, tend to your primary uh, priorities and we can take this park off your hands and, and call it a deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, that's, a, that's a smart way to do it. I think the biggest thing that turned people away was the well issue and right. the unknowns of that and the liability, the possible liability of that. So sure. um, it definitely allowed you to be able to get into it with some, some good terms though. So we did good For terms sure. and, uh, and also be able to, you know, make that community better by putting in a different well too. Right. Yeah. So as far as the, 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 the deal structure and setup with the investors, obviously you didn't syndicate it. So it's just with your partners. How many partners are on this project? So there's five total partners on the project. Uh, we each brought however much capital we were comfortable bringing to the table and we carved up the equity proportionate to the amount of money that we brought to the partnership. So for okay. us, we, it's really not, you know, we're looking to do the simple, all of us, you know, want to get hands on experience run in a park and uh, you know, check in the box on, on first deal and, and uh, finding together to do things. Look, it's also a lot of work too. So we needed multiple people to be able to uh, be hands on to run various aspects of the park. So, you know, we've got on site management there that is doing the day to day, but we need someone to oversee that person. We've got a fair amount of marketing that we're doing to drive leads to eventually bring new residents in to fill in our 20. Uh, our 20 vacant lots. We have this, with this water issue, right? It's own construction project that we need someone to sort of full-time PM on. So there's a variety of roles here that, you know, we all just needed to bind together and actively take part on because uh, we all have day jobs and this is our side gig nights and weekends. 
And uh, so binding together, bringing our capital and uh, each carving out a sleeve that we, that we own and drive has been uh, something that's worked for us. So there's, how do you guys determine how much, I know you said you base it based on the amount of equity that you should bring to the table, but is it, what's the, the, the work might be imbalanced based on the equity coming in. So how does that work? Yeah, it, it, um, it's just sort of uh, an agreement amongst us, right? There's peaks and valleys uh, right now, you know, in, in, the, in the early stages, uh, I probably took a lion's share of the work, but um, it's become a little bit more steady state, whereas some of my partners are ramping up. And um, for us, it's just, we, that was, we were very clear going into this, what we, uh, setting expectations, right? There's no way to always strike fairness in terms of sharing the workload there's going to be times when each of us is going to feel as though we're carrying the lion's share and the other is not doing much and you know what i may own five percent of the deal and be doing 95 percent of the work for that period of time and with the flip being the other way and that's okay so we were very transparent going in hey we're looking not necessarily to hit a home run investment returns wise with this deal just looking to get experience. You know, it's got to be a good deal. Our downside needs to be protected, but investment returns, you know, not being numero uno in terms of priorities. The other, hey, we're just going to need to work together and understand that it's puts and takes on who's bearing the workload. We did do some work up front to really carve out and be thoughtful, I think, about how much should we size the roles? You know, what really makes sense for one person to do? Does that need to be separated into two pieces? Uh, does it even make sense to break certain roles in twice? Maybe it just naturally fits best. So we did some deep thinking up front really about how this would work. And then as we formulated the partnership and agreed to work together, we was very clear about this is gonna be hard. There's a lot of us, I mean, five partners is, is, is a large group for a fairly, fairly small deal such as this. And so it was uh, important, I think, as served as well as we're into this, that we were just clear about, it's gonna be hard to get this done. Let's just, in the spirit of doing a project and gaining experience, let's acknowledge that there's gonna be some rocky roads here and you know, unfair distribution of work at times, but that's okay. We, you know, for the, the grander, the spirit of doing this is to gain experience and to move forward and so uh, we attracted partners that were into that. So as far as the value add, that's, that's going to be a, where you're going to be able to have that potential upside on this particular asset. Uh, obviously, you mentioned the, the 20 vacant lots or whatever that you're going to do some additional marketing and, and, and obviously fill those vacant lots, which will, again, increase that NOI to be able to increase the, the value of the property and increase the returns even during the hold period. What are some other different things that you have done that, that you're planning to do on this asset to be able to you know, push the NOI higher? Sure. So uh, the lot rents are below market. We think we've got a, you know, about $50 worth of room between where we currently are and where the market is in a rapidly growing market. So naturally the rents in the area are escalating um, and we've got a fairly sizable initial gap to close. So that's a big piece of it. Uh, we have a, an opportunity in terms of management costs that we can shave off. I uh, mentioned early on in the call that there are a couple of layers of management on this property. So this was one small piece of a very large portfolio that the owner uh, owned and they weren't actively involved in managing it. So they actually had a large property management firm that oversaw all of their assets in addition to having a full-time park manager that oversees the day-to-day. -day. So in looking at the financials, you know, we saw that there were some excessive management costs there that we plan to ramp down over time, and that will fall straight to the bottom line and boost NOI. Uh, in addition to that, we have some opportunity on ancillary income sources around storage or um, you know, pet fees and, and late fees, just sort of standard stuff that you'd find in the multifamily space that we intend to apply in our park. And then the last is billing back some of uh, the services that are covered for the residents, so landscaping, and uh, trash pickup. 
So when, when you're talking about the leasing on uh, able to increase the rents, obviously you, you, in this particular industry, you have a painful disconnect, if you will. And this is, you know, really no, no pun intended, if you will, because you're disconnecting the home, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, you have a painful disconnect. And so, you know, to be able to tell a, tell a tenant that or a resident that's currently on the, on the park that, you know, you know, after your lease is up, you know, I'm assuming these are typical still 12 yearly, 12, 12 month leases. So month to month. Um, so always month to month. Yeah. So it, it depends, right? You'll see, you'll see it um, span the gamut. Uh, the leases that we received during diligence were about 12 month leases, but they had since expired. There were a handful that were still under the lease period that were just about approaching the end. And so once that lease is uh, expired, by default, it goes into a month to month lease. And so on day one for us, we actually prefer the month to month because it gives us flexibility to boost, you know, the rental rates on a, on a monthly yeah. basis. Um, and to counter, so, so, so then, you know, natural reaction would be, okay, well, that's not so smart because then you don't have a lockdown on your residents. What's the incentive for them to stick around if they can just leave? Well, uh, one of the great things about the mobile home park business is, while it's named, you know, mobile homes, uh, they aren't quite so mobile because it's awfully costly to pick up and move those homes. And the demographic of most of the residents, at least in the communities that we focus on, they don't have, you know, three to five thousand dollars sitting around to pick up and move their home to another park that has favorable rents. So yes, while they have the choice to move and aren't bound by uh, the constraints of a contract or in lease terms. Um, the reality is, is very few of our residents could actually pick up and move out of their park because they don't have the funds to be able to contract with a mover to move their home to another park with more favorable rents. Yeah. And I think that's that painful disconnect, you know, sure. that I was trying yeah. to get at it because right. you can sit there and tell them, Hey, it's going to be an extra $50 a month for to, to rent that lot. Now that you're month to month and they got to balance it out of saying, well, it's going to cost me three to 5,000 to move this thing, or I pay an extra 600 bucks a year. Exactly. Yeah. So how much, uh, how much pushback do you normally see when you do something like that? You know, there's always some noise. Uh, we, we try to keep it at a reasonable rate, right? We're not, we want to build communities where people want to live for a long time. And so I think, you know, affordability and keeping it fair to our residents is really, those are core, you know, values for us. So we would consider it unfair and would shy away from renting, boosting rents by more than $50 a month um, in an, any given year. So while there's, you know, there's some noise always, no one likes to see their rent go up. We try to do it in increments that are palatable and would uh, naturally sort of follow along wage growth. Have you ever, you know, made to try to do a plan where you would, you know, try to get them back on a, on a longer term lease by saying, oh, it's going to be a $50 increase. Or if you sign a 12 month or 24 or 36, they can get a better rate just to keep them on there or or how, not, have you tried something like that before? We have not with existing residents, but for new residents. So move in fees, you know, sometimes we'll just cover the cost of the move in. So, Hey, move into our park and we'll cover the cost. Cause we just want you in there. Cause we know once you're in the, the likelihood of you moving out is pretty low. Um, and, or we'll try things like, you know, free, free lot rent for the first six months to a year. Right. So for the, for the new residents, we're much more uh, flexible and interested in providing those types of incentives. Mm -hmm. But for the existing residents, I mean, it's really just not in our interest to provide any other incentives because we know naturally they're going to be inclined to stay there mm -hmm. um, because it's costly to move their, their home out of the park. So when you have new residents that are coming in and you're giving them that incentive to move them into the park, is that you eating that three to 6,000 or is that, and do you guys have like contracts with local, local you know, mobile home movers that, you know, give you better rates or something? Right. We do. Yeah. So yes, it is us eating cost. That's just, you know, cost of doing business. Um, and yeah, we try to negotiate rates with movers and, you know, in our case, we have 20 move-ins that we're going to want to do over a short period of time. So finding, you know, a contractor, that we can work with consistently and who's reliable and we can give them repeat business. I mean, 20 lots is a lot of move-ins, right? Mm -hmm. That can translate into real dollars for a contract. So that gives us some leverage in negotiating with uh, a volume discount with local movers.
So I know there is it's, it's all the internal JV partners on this one, but you know, before as we're wrapping this up, I want to have you kind of walk me through some of the returns and some of the projections that you guys are looking at for this particular project. So, how, did you did you calculate an IRR on this one? We did. Yeah, we calculated about a low teen IRR over a, a five year hold. Um, and for us, we're we're looking to own parks forever. So ten years is sort of the more interesting uh, IRR metric for us. And we're right about mid-teens IRR for a 10-year hold. Is there a possibility somewhere in that 10-year period to do a, a, obviously you have a balloon in here at five years. So at that five-year balloon, you're going to refine, hopefully pull out some of that initial equity? That's the idea. Yeah. And we think that if we can execute the plan, that uh, it'll be large enough loan that we could entertain some agency debt and get some mm -hmm. really low-cost long-term debt on this thing. And like I said, just own it forever. Mm -hmm. Does they do it? I didn't know that the agencies do it on mobile home parks. They do. Yeah. It's not as deep, uh, uh, you know, and liquid a pool as on the multifamily side, but um, yeah. Uh, Fannie Mae lends on mobile home parks. You know, they don't like to do things and it's very rare that they come in on loan balances below uh, say a million five, a million, but uh, the, the, the funding's out there and yeah. uh, we hope, we hope that it will continue to grow because I think there is uh a real opportunity for, you know, those, uh, those agencies to really support the, the, the growth of affordable housing. But they probably don't like the, the water well issue. So you have to get that fixed. Sure. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. We got some work to do. We got five yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's great from the, from a return spec perspective, especially because it's going to be one of those things where that IRR will probably go through the roof. If you can refi it at that five-year mark and do even better. Well, that's it. Right. So we're, um, we're pretty punitive with our assumptions, right? We want to go, we go in all like totally pessimistic and low ball. Um, I'm intentionally shying away from, we write, con we underwrite conservatively because I just fall out of my chair every time I hear that. Um, <laughs> well, we, I do. I do, yeah, John. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, Dan. Uh, but we really sort of beat it up. Right. And so that for us, it's like, okay, if it really works in a, in a, you know, a low case pessimistic scenario, then great. We're interested. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I was, I was in fact, even when trying to gather partners around, you know, I was an intention, I was intentionally withholding the, even the returns and quoting IRRs because that wasn't the group of people that I wanted to, to attract, right? If you're driven, if you're attracted to this deal because of the returns, well, probably isn't the deal for you because, we're looking to gain experience and to do a project here. And if we, you know, if we're making money along the way, great, but that's, you know, that's sort of the nice side benefit. Um, you know, and, and that's not, that's not the goal for a lot of people, right? They're looking for the returns and um, that's sort of the primary objective of why they get involved in the deal. But for us, it, it wasn't. So um, that sort of led me to behave, you know, kind of negatively on the on the underwriting assumptions and leave a lot of the realistic upside out of the deal so that if we do you know see anything go somewhat positively well it's going to lead to pretty big upside on on uh on the returns so i have two two questions i always like to ask at the end and the first question is uh what did you find easy during the entire process that you maybe thought might have been a little bit harder, but it ended up being pretty easy. So I, I mean, I'll talk out of both sides of my mouth on this one. Uh, so apologies in advance, but you know, finding, finding the partners to work with, um, I thought was going to be very difficult, right? We had sort of a major challenge in front of us, uh, trying to get enough capital to take the deal down and get enough people who were like-minded enough and could actually collaborate well together so that we wouldn't be at each other's throats and just having another stressor in our lives, uh, I thought was going to be a real challenge. And that actually was kind of uh, pessimistic in my outlook for that happening. And what I found, I was just sort of, I was so delighted that I was able to find a group of people that just naturally were looking for the same thing, that were collaborative, um, and we gelled and, you know, just felt good working as a team together. So uh, that's not to say we don't have our challenges now and we didn't have our challenges gelling and, and uh, going through the cycle of, you know, working on figuring out how to work as a team. But uh, going in, if you ask me, I probably would have said there's no way that we're going to find a team with as many people that we needed 
and that would work as collaboratively together as we needed them to throughout a pretty difficult period. And so on the flip side of that, what would you say was harder than expected? And I can probably guess this, but what did you think was harder than expected? Yeah, so that's it, right? Other side of the mouth is um, it just, I mean, it, it, it's a consensus driven process, right? It kind of has to be by nature and to go through this and have to vet and thoroughly unpack some real issues and concerns and unknowns with a group of five people is just so hard, right? It is, it is, you think you acknowledge, you know, I, I've, I've, I have a day job. I've been in, uh, you know, in, in private industry for 15 years now and I've worked with teams and I know what it's like to struggle to work with teams. So I thought I was going in with an informed view, but uh, when it's dealing with your personal money, when it's dealing with lack of certainty and just and inherent risks for things that are scary, right? Like water wells and, you know, poisonous water in those wells. Um, just to, to go through that and not have the flexibility and the nimbleness that you're accustomed to working alone um, was just a, a real challenge. So, um, so, yeah, so that's the contrasting side of it both sides of it. It's good and bad from the partner's perspective and easier yeah. and harder and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule to be with us and sharing us this story about Gray's, Gray's Creek here and uh, looking forward to kind of following you and seeing more deals that you're closing. I know this is only one of two that you closed last year. So maybe we can get you back in here to talk about that other deal as well. Love to. Yeah. Love to. That'd be, I'd enjoy that. Yeah, well, and you can tell that, that we go really deep in these deals, so it's kind of hard to do two in one time. Sure, but I like yeah. to get really, really granular on some of these projects. Yeah, it's been fun, Dan. I appreciate you having me on, and I uh, really had a lot of fun here. Well, tell the listeners how they can reach out to you if they have further questions about this particular project or maybe just mobile home park investing in general or maybe even possibly joining you on a future project. Yeah, sure. So I think the best way to reach out to me is uh, via email, and uh, I, I can give you my email now. It's jjacobus at loanjunipercapital.com. Uh, and we also have a website that is loanjunipercapital.com. Uh, happy to provide those in the show notes and uh, really welcome conversations. Um, I love talking to other owner, investor, operators in the mobile home park space. We think it's a great area to be in and uh, just welcome any conversations, uh, whether those who are interested or looking to new, learn uh, more about the industry. All right. Well, yeah, we'll definitely make sure we have those on the show notes. And once again, thank you so much, John. Appreciate it. And looking forward to having you back on another episode. Thanks again, Dan.